what's up everyone, Laser here. I just had a cool game. Uh, I was playing Orange Blue Stompy, as I am want to do lately because it's just a ton of fun. And I, ha I had this really interesting game where um, I, I kind of took the tempo line no matter what, and it ended up uh, working really, really well. So I wanted to go over it, um, see, show how pushing an advantage can translate into a win, and show how important it can be to seize tempo. So right off the bat, I played the Karen Henge in lane three. Uh, lane three is kind of just where I like to open. I don't know if it's the, the best one to do, but it's, it's where I like to do it. Um, my opponent is on Rainbow's End, so they use the coin to get out a nine year Thane, and then I get one out of my own. So let's, let's take a look here. Just off of turns one and two, we both have the same creature minion on the board. I have the Karen Henge underneath it, and he, God, I hate this thing. My pop filter is just the, the worst. It never stays on. Um, he also has a Thane, but it does not have the Karen Henge under it. So uh, tempo-wise, he is ahead because he can attack with this first. He got to play the first minion. Um, but I have something a little bit stronger, so I can regain tempo with this pretty, uh, pretty... Come on, man. Oh my god, I'm just going to hold this thing up. Uh, he can gain... I can regain tempo back pretty easily with the trading power that the Cairn Henge is providing me. Um, next turn, I'm looking at Black Hatter, which can be very, very good for disruption. And we'll see, we get a couple procs of that and helps a lot. Um, my opponent basically does nothing this turn. Let's take a look at this. So Red Cliffs, it's a two, two mana investment. He plays a purple gem for it. Sure, cost is totally fine, makes a lot of sense. An enchantment with nothing going on top of it has no tempo. It offers nothing to the board immediately and only offers the promise of a stronger board in later turns. What this means is he basically, in terms of board presence, had no development this turn whatsoever. And he did it in front of my strongest trading tool. So I already have this Einyar Thane, which is very, very strong. Uh, and if they play anything here, the Red Cliffs doesn't actually buff the creature that goes down here. All it does is say that it deals a damage to the opposing three lanes and it turns off Rush. I don't really have a lot of Rush in the deck, so that's kind of irrelevant. And the dealing one damage, okay, sure, that, that's kind of nice, but... The Einar Thane can heal and already is a stronger trading tool than anything on the board now anyway, so I still have the ability to take tempo back if they're going to contest. Going on, I think that's all for the turn. Yep, Brainstorm. Uh, this is an interesting decision here I, that I burn that Brainstorm. That is effectively the same thing as doing nothing for a turn if I decide to play it. Sure, I get some cards, but it would take up all of my mana and it would not push my board state at all. It would end up being a board state neutral play. So instead of going for that, I end up going for the Black Hatter. It's a 2 3, which is a little understated for the cost, but the disruption ability of uh, the discard on breaches can be very, very problematic for a lot of decks. And also I'm pushing damage with my strong 3-4. I put it here because even if they trade, they'd need another resource expenditure in order to get rid of the Black Hatter. And, actually this positioning is interesting, by putting it here, if this moves over, this gives me either here, here, or here. Lanes 1, 2, and 7, all open for teleport plays to proc the Breach. It makes him lose the opportunity to attack unless he has something that can give it a move like a Fossigrim, but uh, that's a really narrow case. And even if they do, it would have to be Fossigrim plus the Infuse to actually make the trade, which he doesn't have enough mana for. So this is, is relatively safe, and by playing it here, I offer myself more or less the most options possible in order to get the Breach to happen next turn. Especially when if I do that, I can just, you know, put down two Eager Recruits for the turn and call it a day. Uh, so I, I like that play. I'm very happy with it. He plays a Neo Gongo. Here's another play where they basically didn't do anything. What they did was they put down a plus one, plus one. That was their entire turn is giving this creature plus one, plus one. When you think about it, they spent three mana to get one, one worth of stats. If there was a three mana, one, one card in the game that did nothing else, it would never be played. Sure, Neo Gongam also gives warded, but in terms of contesting the board that I'm building when I have the stronger board presence already and I'm going to even up health, it doesn't really do anything. It's a very uh, long-term play. It makes his, uh, his already established threats harder to deal with, 
but it doesn't really push the pace of the game at all, leaving me with the ability to um, seize tempo back here. And I do with the use of this Valkyrie Enforcer. Valkyrie Enforcer is not a particularly strong card in terms of stats, it's a 2-2 two, two for 4, but what it does offer is the ability to negate your opponent's play. So what did this just do? Well, it bounced back on your Thane off of a Neo Gongo. Cool. What does that mean for the state of the game? What that means is he had a 3-4 that for all intents and purposes for this turn, I destroyed. And I got a 2-2 out of it. So basically, I had 5-6 worth of points swing by playing Valkyrie Enforcer. And that means he can't use the established creature, Dominion, to contest what I have going on. So I get to keep all of these minions over here that I've already established that are already doing work for me and deny something away from my opponent. This tempo play is really, really big and is basically the most pivotal game, uh, turn in the game. We'll see how much that matters over the course of the next few turns, where I have a pretty big board already set up and my opponent isn't really able to stick anything. So Valkyrie Enforcer, I've run it as a one of and this is exactly why. In some cases, it just blows the game out. My opponent drops Kara, which, really strong card. 6-5 that grows, it has warded because it's on top of Neo Gangam. But remember, warded means it cannot be damaged or destroyed outside of combat. The reason I run Seal of Exile, and the reason Seal of Exile is such a powerful card, is that it banishes the minion, it doesn't destroy it, which means it can get around being warded, which is incredibly powerful. And here, uh, so, spoiler alert, I'm going to play Seal of Exile on Kara and push a bunch of damage. What that means is... What this means is that my pop filter is going to fall again. I'm sacrificing mana and a gem in order to push the tempo. Removal can be a tempo tool. Usually, people think of removal as a way to be a control tool in controlling decks. Things like Misanthropia, things like Vicious Cycle. Hard removal tends to be things that are predominantly used for uh, controlling the board. However, you can use it as a tempo tool as well, like I just did here. This means that I negated their turn and got to continue pressing the board advantage that I've already built. Uh, at this point, I'm already very far ahead. They're low on life. I do need to keep my creatures, however. Um, I have the tempo advantage. I really need to keep it. I, I really didn't expect Fork Lightning. I'll be honest. That's, that's just not a card that I expected to see. He gets a pretty nice play here. The Einyar Thane onto the Red Cliffs makes this an even trade, and if that's the case, then well, I don't know what these cards are, so I imagine these aren't just, you know, basically do-nothing cards. Um, this will mean that I still have the tempo advantage after this trade goes through, but uh, he, he's at least giving himself a way to try and claw back in. So this is, this is a nice play. Thankfully, Shot of Our Beast is one of the best cards in the game right now. It nerfs down the Einyar Thane to only one attack, so it cannot kill my Einyar Thane. And it nerfs down his defense to three so that my Thane can trade into it, and it heals itself back up. This is another really, really nice tempo play where I'm keeping um, I'm keeping the pressure on my opponent at all points during the game, and I'm really getting good two for ones basically the entire game, or like one and a half for ones in some cases. So I get the trade, I get the Einyar Thane back to full health, I get to push damage, and uh, oddly enough, my opponent concedes here because they have um, two enchantments that don't do anything. God, my nose is really itchy today, as well as a Draugr, which he can't play, so there's there's really not much left for my opponent to do. They end up tapping out, and we take the victory. So, what what, what was the pivotal point in that game? What were the lessons to learn there? Well, there, there are two. The first pivotal play was using the Valkyrie Enforcer to bounce my opponent's 3-4 on your Thane. What that meant was it was, like I said, a 5-6 worth of stats swing off of that play, it opened up that side of the board for me to control with my reactive tools, 
And that also showed exactly why I include some of those reactive tools in my mid-range beatdown deck. If I can establish a board control and then use my reactive tools to keep it, that means that I'm always keeping tempo. Uh, if, if you're familiar with um, a lot of MTG terms, this is basically what aggro control is in Magic the Gathering, where you're the aggressive deck, but you're aggressing by making sure your opponent can't do anything while you use your threats you've already developed. Uh, it's a very, very difficult concept. I would say probably the most difficult concept in card games to, to get in the beginning. Um, but I think tempo is incredibly interesting and one that I really like exploring. And I think this game really showcased why the tempo was so important. Uh, so there will be the deck list in the comments. It's a, a little bit different than the orange-blue stompy I've been playing in previous videos. I added the Shot of Our Beast because it's just it's so good right now as well as a couple other changes, but overall it's still kind of the same mid-range beat down with a couple of reactive tools that it's been. Highly suggest it. I climbed, I think, like six ranks in gold over the last week or so. Um, I'm doing a little bit less gameplay, a little bit more analysis because I'm trying to hit Mythic, Mithril, whatever the top rank is before the season ends, and I'm really, really bad at playing while talking. So we're going to be looking out for more um, analytic content to do, and I thought this was a good one. So uh, let me know if you like this kind of content. It's probably what I'm going to be working on moving forward because I find this a little more fun for me to work on, a little more rewarding. Um, and if there's any topics in particular you'd like me to cover in the game, I would love to know it so I can try and, uh, you know, help you guys out on your Mythgard journeys. So if you like this kind of content, like, comment, and subscribe. It really, really helps the channel. Let's me know that you like what I'm doing. Um, and until then, I'll see you next time.